Welcome to the Capital Forum's interview series. My name is Joe Tipograph, and we're delighted to have Jennifer Driscoll Chippendale here today. Jennifer is a partner at Shepherd Mullen, and she is currently serving on the nominating committee for the ABA section of antitrust law. Previously, she was a vice chair of the section's international committee. Before joining Shepherd and Mullen, Jennifer worked for law firms in New York, London, and Paris. Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, let's uh, let's dive right in. So, the first thing I want to talk to you about today is the transition that we've been seeing at the agencies, um, going from stru more structural arguments regarding mergers mm -hmm. towards more storytelling and competitive effect stories. What are you seeing out there right now? I think that you hit the nail on the head, Joe. Um, Previously, the agencies uh, focused on market concentration and market power uh, in doing merger analyses. And in a way, that was beneficial to the parties proposing mergers because there was a very bright line rule, a very much a bright line rule in place, and it made predicting the outcome of proposed mergers quite easy. Uh, the storytelling approach is much more nuanced and many more variables are considered. For instance, the presence of so-called maverick firms uh, that constrain the price of uh, two big rivals. Uh, they now look at the actual adverse effects that have occurred in other markets. Um, and they look at uh, disparities across geographic markets, time periods, and customer bases. So the uh, variety of factors that are considered are a great uh, boon for both the agencies and the parties trying to get through a merger because there's a lot more to consider rather than these hard and fast market concentration rules. The downside for parties that are proposing to merge is that it is much less certain exactly what the agencies will focus on when they are evaluating a merger. Well, that, that, that is interesting, but you know, your job as the Antitrust mm -hmm. Council is to mm -hmm. help them kind of predict what is going to happen. So mm -hmm. what trends have you been seeing that, that sort of help you mm -hmm. uh, make these predictions when you serve your clients? You know, I do think that upward pricing pressure uh, and the impact that uh, consumers will uh, experience in the market, either through lack of alternatives, reduced output, but again, most significantly uh, increased prices is still the focal point of any uh, merger analysis. Uh, the consumer welfare standard is alive and well, and that uh, type of analysis and meeting those thresholds are what I counsel my clients to focus on. Okay. Um, now, you know, while the agency practice hasn't conform to the bright line rule necessarily, the law still has a bright line rule. Mm -hmm. uh, brown shoe is still very alive and well, and it mm -hmm. requires uh, firms to define a relevant market, which will be defined by interchangeability mm -hmm. of use mm -hmm. or cross elasticity of demand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where do you see this change in agency practice interacting with the law? Uh, well, the most obvious example is the 2010 merger guidelines, where uh, a lot of commentators have accused uh, the agencies of giving short shrift to the importance of defining a relevant market. Um, to the extent that that reflects agency practice, and I think it does, uh, the uh, potential anti-competitive effects that exist overall uh, become much more important uh, to both to the agencies and uh, conversely the need for uh, parties looking to merge to overcome the presumption of anti-competitive anti -competitive effects generally rather than a specific defined market. And, and, and where do you think this can lead us in the next five to ten years and how it might change merger policy? I think that merger policy is going to become much more flexible and fluid. It will empower the agencies to experiment and challenge, experiment with different methods of assessing markets and also uh, challenging certain mergers that maybe before would have gone through under a more uh, bright line uh, analysis. For the parties, uh, there is still a lot to learn. Um, from uh, the from what the agencies do within the next couple of years, uh, certainly with Bill Baer taking over the division, 
He has um, a wealth of experience in evaluating and challenging merger transactions. Uh, parties can look to the cases that he litigated in at, while uh, at the FTC to see what he's thinking and where he might be going. The FTC has always been a little bit more activist in their approach to mergers, um, and I expect that trend to continue. What I do think is promising for parties uh, in the face of uncertainty is the agency's willingness to uh, experiment or impose structural remedies that will allow transactions to go through subject to certain divestitures of assets or uh, product lines. All right. Now, you talked about um, the, the future of merger being more flexible and possibly reaching types mm -hmm. of, of deals that may have not been mm -hmm. uh, reached before by, mm -hmm. by current uh, mm -hmm. merger jurisprudence. Could you think of some examples of, of possibly industries or types of mergers that might fall into that category? Uh, certainly uh, technology and uh, the communications industry uh, where there is a challenging balance between maintaining growth and innovation uh, uh, in the markets and the industry as a whole. Uh, that is certainly an area where experimentation may lend itself. Now, with the AT&T T-Mobile case, uh, there really were no viable alternatives. It was an all or nothing situation. But with the Motorola Mobility merger, uh, I think that we saw the kind of flexibility that the agencies may be willing to uh, uh, offer uh, the merging parties. Now, the purpose of merger law is to prevent mergers that the effect is substantially to lessen competition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and currently, to evaluate that, we apply this consumer welfare standard. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the consumer welfare standard? The consumer welfare standard focuses on the impact uh, of consumers in the relevant market in terms of the transfer of wealth. So to the extent that a proposed merger actually results in wealth literally being transferred to consumers, usually through saving money uh, with lower prices, increased innovation, more choice, uh, that transaction is likely to be approved under the standard. Uh, the counterpoint to uh, the consumer welfare standard is the total welfare standard that was espoused by the Chicago School. And under that philosophy, it is the total increase of wealth in the market that matters. So to the extent that uh, sellers are reaping the benefits of the increased wealth uh, in the market, that's okay. That's uh, allocative efficiency at its best. And a merger is still permissible even if the consumers aren't feeling it in their pocket. Okay, and and that's the state of the law today. But you know, we, we we start with competition. This is this, the Clayton Act was designed to preserve competition. How has the conversation gotten to wealth? Um, because wealth is a great indicator of whether competition is present in a market. To the extent that prices are going down and there's mo more choice, to the extent that we're seeing. Uh, new entrants uh, challenge the incumbents in the markets with new products or lower prices. Uh, that reflects, again, the increased power of the consumer in that market to uh, make choices and reap benefits of lower prices. Aren't there other benefits that come from competition that don't relate to price, um, such as uh, innovation or even things that are a little bit more removed from antitrust like systemic risk and uh, labor. I mean, aren't these all benefits of competition that, that should come into play or could come into play? They could come into play, uh, but I think that they are secondary concerns. I still think that under the consumer welfare standard, uh, the emphasis is on the consumer. Okay. And what about up the supply chain? I mean, we have suppliers, sometimes very small farmers, selling to very big organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how much are their needs and, and, and how competition affects them coming into play in merger analysis? Well, 
Putting aside the political considerations that may be associated with the agricultural industry, and uh, I can't understate those, those are substantial, uh, the issue then becomes uh, an inquiry into the, uh, the power of uh, the buyers in that market and what we refer to as monopsony power in a market. Uh, that is supposedly uh, analyzed much the same way a combination of sellers would be. But there are indications that the agencies may treat such an analysis differently. Uh, in a 2006 speech delivered by Tom Rush uh, addressing the Weyerhaeuser decision, uh, which is the latest pronouncement uh, of monopsony power in a market, he said that the emphasis was on consumers and therefore the impact of uh, the impact that would result from a combination of powerful buyers was irrelevant and would should not and would not be treated the same way as uh, a combination of sellers. Now, I'm not sure if that is still the prevailing philosophy within the agencies, but it certainly is a provocative statement and a very interesting approach to evaluating potential monopsony power in a market. Doesn't that start to equate um, competition with purely with price when if monopsony power leads to lower prices but reduces choice, mm -hmm. um, consumers are better off. So do, do, do they get neglected as a result of this, the, the weaker upstream suppliers? You know, there are indications that uh, what matters uh, in such analyses is the existence of viable alternatives in the market. So to the extent that suppliers have other opportunities or outlets to uh, sell their wares or their products, uh, that, uh, that obviously helps uh, mitigate the risk of buyers acquiring too much power within the market. Uh, and that will temper uh, an otherwise uh, challengeable merger where in the short run there may be an increase in price. Okay, all right. Now earlier today you brought up the Chicago School. Mm -hmm. um, what, what prevailing impact do you see the Chicago School having on merger um, analysis today? Well, I think that the influence has waned a bit. Uh, during the Reagan and Bush administrations, uh, when the, the impact of the Chicago School was at its height, uh, we saw a lot more merger activity and mergers that may have been challenged under a more democratic administration going through. And in the uh, latest Bush administration, when that was coming to a close, I remember I and many other uh, merger practitioners advising our clients that look, if you're contemplating a combination or a merger in a market, now is the time to push it through. Because again, this emphasis on total welfare in the market certainly enhances the ability of sellers to push through um, a transaction. I think that that has waned a bit under the Obama administration, but that's not to say that the Obama administration uh, has taken a totally uh, rigid approach to uh, merger analysis. I think it's reasonable. I think that there is a tempering of the Chicago standard with the consumer welfare standard that so far uh, seems to be leading to fair and equitable results in merger transactions. Okay. Um, what would it take to really shift the momentum in, in the opposite direction? Would it, would it take legislative reform, a big uh, Supreme Court decision, or would it really just take an entire new school of thought to emerge in order to see um, the, the ideas that, that total wealth maximization should play less of a role in determining merger outcomes? I think it would have to come from legislative reform. And the reason that I say that as opposed to Supreme Court decisions is that so few merger transactions are litigated because of uh, the risk and the stakes uh, in going to trial. And as, as a result of that, even fewer wind up going to the Supreme Court. 
Um, legislative reform would certainly rectify any imbalances in merger or any perceived imbalances in merger review almost immediately. Uh, and that would be the most successful way for uh, the policy uh, to be changed. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the current state of, of antitrust doctrine is, is very mature. Uh, mm -hmm. these, these statutes have been around for almost 100 mm -hmm. years and some mm -hmm. of them mm -hmm. even more. Um, is, is, is there a possible, where, where are the biggest wiggle rooms, uh, the biggest uncertainty continue to lie when we're talking about uh, consumer welfare and how these uh, issues are considered? Um, again, uh, the, the, the alleged lack of clarity in the merger guidelines and to the extent that court precedent has not caught up with the merger guidelines, which again are strictly persuasive. Uh, they do not have uh, binding authority in any way. Uh, that will make uh, this issue a challenge. If we've got two mergers, one in the US, one in the EU, and they have the same competitive impact, mm -hmm. what, what different results might we see between the two? Well, there are several considerations to take into account. First, uh, the U.S. agencies are charged strictly with the mandate of enforcing antitrust laws. The Commission, on the other hand, has a much broader scope of factors to consider because they are responsible for establishing the economic policy within the European community. So on the Commission's website, for example, uh, when they're discussing uh, the merger review process, they take into they take into account factors that the uh, U.S. does not necessarily consider, such as uh, the ability to promote growth within the European Committee, and most significantly, whether a proposed merger will enhance the standard of living within the European community. So th that, that, that's an interesting point. The standard of living, is that the same thing as consumer welfare, what we have here in the United States? I think it is a deeper philosophy within the European Union where uh, it suggests not only empowering consumers in a market, but raising their standard of living as a whole. So rather than focusing on the impact uh, within a relevant product and geographic market, uh, the community is more likely to take into account the ripple effects uh, in both economic, political, and social arenas. Okay, so besides this, the legal standards, what other differences do you see between anti uh, antitrust in Europe and the United States? Well, it's a little bit hard to discern because uh, merger review in the contemporary sense only started in the European Commission in the 1990s. So given the newness of the regime, uh, we have less precedent to examine. Uh, the one counterpoint to uh, the lack of precedent is that after a phase one review is completed by the commission, they will publish a decision that illuminates their reasoning and considerations in evaluating the transaction. Um, that obviously does not exist in the United States uh, because of the sheer volume of transactions that the agency, agencies consider in any given year. Uh, another difference uh, lies in uh, the remedies that the EU is, or the Commission, is willing to impose uh, to put through a merger transaction. And some of these remedies are arguably much more invasive than the structural remedies that are imposed in the U.S. Um, let's take uh, the Microsoft case, for example, which was not a merger, but is certainly illuminating in terms of the different approaches that uh, U.S. and uh, agencies and the Commission may very well take. In the U.S., uh, there was really a series of structural remedies that were uh, addressed at the district court level. These, of course, were, some of them were overturned on appeal, uh, but the emphasis wasn't on modifying, uh, or it, the emphasis was on modifying behavior through uh, restructuring the company. In the 
EU, Microsoft was ordered to give its rivals and uh, downstream dependents access to its source code and its proprietary information to facilitate competition in the market. And I don't think it would be unheard of for that type of liberal access uh, to proprietary information to become more prominent in the Commission's merger review. Okay. Um, so it, it sounds like there are um, bigger risks for deals as they, they go through Europe compared to um, the United States, at least in these different areas that we've spoken about so mm -hmm, far. Mm -hmm. um, how does the process work? Does it, does it give uh, companies a, a better opportunity to, to challenge these, uh, these penalties or, or these standards? Well, one significant difference between review in the U.S. and the EU is the access that merging parties have to the latter. Uh, the Commission has been very liberal with informal consultations, which give merging parties um, early insight into what may be pro problematic to the Commission or what's going to go through quite easily. It is highly unusual for the staff at the agencies to divulge uh, their, uh, their thoughts and their approach uh, to a proposed transaction so informally or at such an early stage. Usually the agency's views on proposed remedies or um, issues that may be endemic in a proposed transaction uh, don't come into uh, or don't emerge until they are in the thick of litigation or in rather contentious negotiations. The antitrust agencies in Europe are regulators where the antitrust agencies in the United States are enforcers. In other words, when the DOJ or the FTC decides to challenge a merger, that's really the beginning. It goes to court and mm -hmm. the, the agency has the burden of proof for establishing mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that a merger has the effect of substantially lessening competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the in, in EU, the antitrust authorities make the decision. Does this create a higher burden of proof for companies when it comes to um, overcoming a merger challenge? Yes, I believe it does, and there is um, a much more rigorous process in place uh, should it go to phase two review. Um, to the extent that, a, that the parties wind up uh, at odds over a transaction, the Commission will issue a statement of objections laying out its case, um, which is considered, which is going to be accorded a great deal of deference in terms of whether or not a transaction should go through. And after that, there, it, there may be a hearing requested by one or both parties on the merits of the transaction. But unlike the U.S. system, which is an adversarial system, uh, the EU uh, employs uh, techniques at the hearing that are a little bit less rigorous and arguably favor the Commission. Uh, unsworn testimony is allowed both from rivals and consumers, and there is no opportunity for cross-examination. So uh, when you allow your rivals to go in and testify about the proposed impact of a merger, uh, that is a much dicier proposition uh, than allowing an agency to look at the economic aspects of a transaction. Okay. And, you know, the, the, the antitrust authorities of the United States and, and the EU, they, they communicate a lot. I know there's mm -hmm. the International Competition Network. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in the EU, we have an example of a very sophisticated uh, regime mm -hmm employing, as you said, a, a very new merger mm -hmm. um, regime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, how closely is the United States merger, uh, you know, the, the, the United States stakeholders looking at Europe uh, as an example of how to possibly modify um, antitrust law? Well, I don't know if you're ever going to see true harmonization in merger review between the U.S. and EU because of the fundamental political uh, differences in uh, U.S. economic theory and European economic theory. Again, it goes back to this idea of the consumer and uh, low prices versus broader political and social considerations. 
However, I think that you will see increased cooperation and sharing uh, between uh, the U.S. and the EU, which is going to lead, uh, which is going to be much more conducive to uh, the U.S. agencies and the Commission reconciling whatever differences they may have in approaching a transaction. I think that we're going to see more and more cooperation and that may manifest itself in decisions uh, that uh, more closely resemble each other. You know, certainly the GE Honeywell uh, transaction uh, is probably something that uh, if pressed uh, both uh, the enforcers and the regulators would say they'd rather not see repeated. Great. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me today. That is all the time we have for the Capital Forum interview series. Have a great day. Thanks.